are in listen only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the Planet webinar series. My name is Raya Smiley and I will be facilitating the webinar today. This is the sixth event in the 2016 Basics webinar series. And apologies on the date on the screen. It in fact is September 22nd, so you are in the right place. Um, Planet is the council's effort to provide educational opportunities for the 2040 comprehensive plan update process. And Planet is uh, not only Planet not only includes the webinar series, but also involves workshops, seminars, and conferences. We are also expanding the local planning handbooks online resources with a series of online tutorials and expert articles on all items related to comprehensive planning. We will be introducing new resources continuously, so you may want to check the online resources regularly. If you have any questions during this presentation please post them by using the webinars control panel. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we will answer as many of your questions as possible. You may want to keep the control panel open throughout the presentation so you uh, receive any announcements made during the webinar. Also, there are two handouts available for you, uh, a fact sheet on transit ways and a uh, transit planning resource sheet. Today's session is Transit Planning Basics, Market Areas, and Comprehensive Planning. Let me briefly introduce you to the presenters for today's webinar. Mike Larson. Good afternoon, everyone. Is a senior planner and sector representative at the Metropolitan Council, working with communities along the Metro Green Line and Blue Line extensions. He's also the co-project manager for the Transit-Oriented Development Guide and serves on the Technical Advisory Committee to the Transportation Advisory Board. Michael Mechtenberg Hello. is a senior planner in service development at Metro Transit, working on a variety of transit projects from bus service planning to TOD grant reviews to pedestrian access issues. Mike, I'll turn it over to you to begin the presentation. Thanks, Raya. Today's webinar is focused on transit planning basics, transit market areas, and comprehensive planning in support of transit. Our goal is to help communities develop comprehensive plans that meet requirements related to transit, improve conditions for transit service, and improve conditions for transit riders. Our first topic, transit planning basics, will address the conditions under which transit service works the most efficiently and cost-effectively. Communities throughout the region have control over many of these conditions. The webinar will then address transit market areas. These are parts of the region where development patterns and demographics influence, influence the likelihood of transit usage, which in turn influences the type of services that can be, be provided cost-effectively. An understanding of market areas can help communities establish realistic goals for transit. We'll discuss regional planning for transit improvements, including Metro Transit Service Improvement Plan and planning for re future regional transit ways. The webinar will then address comprehensive planning, including the variety of ways that communities can improve conditions for transit. We will address new policy requirements in the transportation policy plan, as well as ways to get more out of your plan. First, Michael will discuss fundamentals of service planning in transit planning basics. Michael? Thanks, Mike. Service planning is a trade-off in allocating limited resources. On one hand, planners could maximize the return on the public's investment by only focusing on high volume, high ridership routes. These routes benefit the most people and thus use public resources more efficiently. On the other hand, we have a responsibility to serve the entire region including areas that might under, underperform based on traditional metrics. The key is finding the right balance of services for the right market. In the next few, few slides, I'll talk about some of the characteristics of, of successful transit service. You'll see the strong relationship between land use and effective transit. Effective transit serves people, and the more people within walking distance, the more successful the transit route. Let's assume that the route in this example will capture a baseline of 10% of potential riders. The scenario on the left serves 1,000 residents with 100 riders, while the one on the right serves 200 residents or 20 riders. 
The high ridership on the productive example could lead to additional service, increasing the mode split above the baseline to 15% and potentially attracting more development. Conversely, the low ridership example might see a reduction in trips, which would degrade the mode split to 5%. In both instances, there is a feedback loop between density, transit service, and ridership. For example, the mixed-use building on the left is part of the larger heart of the city development in Burnsville that includes retail, housing, and recreational activities. Conversely, while Anoka Technical College is a good ride generator, there are very few other destinations nearby to support service. Safe pedestrian access is critical to getting riders to their final destination. But beyond mere access are pedestrian-friendly designs that can make walking an easy and even enjoyable part of the trip. Orienting buildings toward the street, adding trees and other plantings, and placing parking in the rear are some common steps to a walkable environment. With tree-lined streets, active storefronts, and on-street parking, the retail node in St. Anthony Park, shown on the left, is very inviting to pedestrians. While it has some elements of walkability, such as sidewalks and boulevard trees, many of the retail destinations at Midway are big box stores set far back from the street. This makes the final connection from the transit stop to the building entrance very challenging for pedestrians. Transit works best when it serves a mix of uses. Our more productive routes have a high amount of churn, that is, riders getting on and off through the entire length of the corridor. This is because these routes serve a multitude of destinations that are active throughout the day. On the other hand, routes that serve primarily residential neighborhoods tend to fill up until they reach their final destination, say a transitway station or major employment center where all the riders get off. These largely job-oriented feeder routes provide an important link in the transit network but are less likely to warrant high levels of off-peak or weekend service. The Excelsior and Grand Development in St. Louis Park, shown on the left, includes residential, office, and retail that acts as both an origin and destination for riders. This supports all-day transit service. Conversely, neighborhoods that are primarily residential tend to be more commute-oriented, with most of the ridership during the morning and afternoon rush hours. As previously mentioned, transit is more successful when it's accessible to a high number of potential riders. We normally consider a quarter mile radius as a potential market for a bus stop and a half mile for a transitway station. In reality, however, access can be much more limited. Barriers to access can be natural, such as a river or lake, or man-made, such as a highway or large building. It's also very common, particularly in suburban communities, to have residential streets that do not follow the grid pattern. These barriers reduce the effective reach of transit, in turn lowering ridership and productivity. Downtown Hopkins, on the left, has a traditional street grid with few barriers. This makes walking more direct. While a strong retail node, the street networks surrounding major shopping centers often have many physical barriers. This makes walking more circuitous. Transit is more competitive where parking is either limited in availability or paid. This can be achieved by reducing parking to the minimum required and placing it in the rear, while at the same time promoting transit-friendly options like walking and biking. It might also be possible to reserve some parking spaces for carpooling or car sharing. This example on the left near the University of Minnesota promotes walking and biking through physical separation and clear signage. Other areas are more auto-oriented with fewer multimodal connections to transit. Directness matters for riders, since every extra turn adds delay and complication to a route. The best routes serve long, dense corridors that include a mix of uses. An early streetcar corridor 
Lake Street has a balanced mix of density and land uses. This helps Route 21 be one of our most productive. Other areas have major destinations just off the main corridor. Route 30 in Northeast Minneapolis must deviate off Broadway Street to serve the Quarry Shopping Center, adding delay for through riders. Here are a few other factors we consider when planning transit service. Park and rides play an important role in the transit system, particularly for downtown commuters. These serve market areas that lack the density for regular route service and, in effect, create artificial density by having riders come to us. A recent survey showed that reliability was the top consideration for riding transit. Reducing variables such as traffic, signal delay, and boarding time can both speed up service and provide more consistent travel times. This has been utilized in both our LRT and BRT services with positive customer response. Frequency matters. As mentioned earlier, frequency can have a feedback effect. The greater the frequency, the higher the ridership, and higher ridership can then justify even better frequency. Good frequency reduces average waiting time and facil facilitates better connections. And in the unlikely event of a missed trip, the next one wouldn't be far behind. Finally, there is a network effect with transit. Just like with the first two telephones, a single transit line would have very limited use. However, every additional line opens up an exponential number of new destinations. We need to make the best use of public resources that are entrusted to us, which is done by carefully balancing the productivity and coverage of our services. You can help by adopting some of the land use factors that support transit. Finally, we need to be flexible in how we deliver service, and a big part of that is knowing the markets and the goals of that service. One tool we often use are the transit market areas, which Mike Larson will talk about next. Thanks, Mike. Um, Michael discussed transit planning basics. Now we'll turn to transit market areas, which is based on research by the Metropolitan Council, which shows that there are main factors that greatly influence transit use throughout the region. These areas are associated with development patterns that have occurred over time, as well as present day demographic conditions. They include density, both population and employment, intersection density, which represents the interconnectedness of the local street system and therefore the directness of walking routes and the number of cars owned by residents. The Metropolitan Council defines transit market areas based on these factors. Each market area is associated with different types of transit services based on demand and their cost effectiveness. Transit market areas follow census block groups, not city boundaries. Most communities have more than one transit market area, and they should be discussed in your comprehensive plan. Parts of your community be, may be in the same market area as parts of an adjoining community. Understanding transit market areas can help your community develop a vision for potential improvements in transit services. We'll briefly discuss each transit market area. Transit market area one includes the densest network of local routes with the highest level of service. This is possible due to the high population employment density, an interconnected network of streets, lower automobile availability, and proximity to employment centers and other destinations. This map shows the extent of Transit Market Area 1, which is limited to the cores of both Minneapolis and St. Paul. Transit Market Area 2 has a similar pattern of development as Transit Market Area 1, but with lower population and employment densities. Service does include local routes, but frequency and the span of service over the day may be lower. This map shows the extent of Transit Market Area 2, which as you can see includes the remainder of Minneapolis and St. Paul, and several older urban center and urban communities like the interring suburbs of St. Louis Park, Robbinsdale, Columbia Heights, and South St. Paul. Due to lower densities and less connected street patterns, the primary emphasis of transit in Transit Market Area 3 is commuter express bus service to the downtowns. 
However, there are local bus routes that provide basic coverage to major destinations and transit centers like the region's various suburban shopping centers. This map shows the extent of Transit Market Area 3, which includes major portions of suburban and suburban edge communities like Burnsville, Woodbury, and Coon Rapids. Transit Market Area 4 has yet lower density development, so the focus of transit is primarily peak period express service Local transit service is less common in these areas. This map shows the extent of Transit Market Area 4, which includes suburban edge and emerging suburban edge communities. Examples include the cities of Chanhassen, Prior Lake, and Farmington. Transit Market Area 5 includes the rural and agricultural communities in the region. Density is too low in these areas to support either express or local bus service. Freestanding town centers are locations throughout the region that have good density and urban form for transit, but are small and isolated to the extent that it's difficult to support cost-effective local or express bus service. In this map, transit Market Area 5 is represented by the yellow area, and the freestanding town centers are represented by the red dots. The region also has a number of areas called emerging market areas. These are areas that have historic development patterns that are different from the surrounding area, or which are the result of recent intensification. The example on the right shows Eden Prairie's three transit market areas, which include transit market areas three and four, as well as an emerging, emerging transit market area two in the town center area near Eden Prairie Center. This area will be served by the future extension of the Metro Green Line. The city has undertaken planning to encourage further development and to make the area more walkable and accessible from the surrounding area. Emerging market areas are located throughout the region and represent areas with greater opportunity for better transit service. Metro Transit Service Improvement Plan, or SIP, is a comprehensive list of bus improvements that are prioritized to best meet regional goals. Completed in 2014, it is a long-range plan that, we, that will be updated every four to five years. The Met Council's plans for transit growth are laid out in the 2040 TPP. The SIP does a similar, similar level of future planning for local and express buses. It's important to note that projects identified in the SIP, including those that scored high, are not included in our existing operating budget. That said, projects identified in the SIP, SIP were included in the Council's 2015 legislative program, helping to make the case for additional transit funding by showing how more funding would benefit riders using the local and express bus network. All providers in the region should have a service improvement plan. This, mo this map shows the regional providers and the cities they serve. Also shown is the capital levy, uh, ca transit capital levy communities outlined in red. These are communities that agree to allow a property tax levy that supports regional transit capital funding. Because this funding supports the capital investment and in the regular route system, this is the area where regular route service can be provided based on regional policy. Three main categories of evaluation measures were determined to help review and prioritize specific service improvements. The direction laid out by the Met, by the Met Council in Thrive MSP 2040, strategies in the 2040 TPP, and the results of stakeholder outreach shape the evaluation measures and weighting. They work together as a system to emphasize productivity, ensure social equity, and provide access to the entire region. Based on the evaluation criteria, projects were sorted into three categories, high, medium, or low. Projects scoring either a high or medium were prioritized for implementation. 
These projects are taken together and represent the resource requirements and ridership growth figures projected as a result of the SIP. Arterial BRT projects, which are included in the resource and ridership projections, are not evaluated under the SIP criteria because they have been prioritized and evaluated in a past study. SIP projects are assigned to one of three implementation phases based on factors like when a related transitway or other project is projected to open. We receive project ideas from internal departments, city and county staff, and from the general public through a robust engagement process. In total, 185 projects were evaluated, with 148 scoring high enough to be included in the recommended plan. Of these, almost 40% expanded coverage, nearly 50% improved frequency, and around 35% increased the span of service. Note that a project can have more than one improvement type. This map gives a high level look at all the improvements that we considered, differentiated by score. You'll see that the projects are dispersed throughout the entire region and across all route types, express, suburban, and urban local. Next, we'll take a closer look at one project that's already been implemented. Route 721, highlighted in yellow, is a suburban local route serving Brooklyn Center, Crystal, New Hope, and Brooklyn Park. It provides an important connection between Hennepin Technical College on the upper left and the Brooklyn Center Transit Center on the lower right. The proposed improvement was increased weekend frequency. The project scored well enough on several key metrics and received an overall score of high. New weekend service on Route 721 was implemented in December 2015 and is performing above expectations. When considering where to invest our resources, the top priority is to ensure that the existing system continues to work at a high level. This means continuous evaluation and adjustment to running time, frequency, and connections. We also have to consider impacts that both seasonal and multi-year detours have on our service. Expansion of the transit network happens one trip at a time. Any entirely new route is a major commitment, so we need to be very selective on when and where to add the service. A strong partnership with local communities and area stakeholders will give this new service the best opportunity to succeed. The Regional Transportation Policy Plan, or TPP, includes two scenarios for the future system of transitways. One is the current revenue scenario. This represents the federal requirement that the transportation plan be fiscally constrained, identifying only projects that can be funded by likely revenues and resources. Communities must include these transitways in their plans. Comprehensive plans should discuss the status of projects that are under development, including planning for potential alignment and station locations. The TPP also includes an increased revenue scenario that identifies further transit investments if additional resources can be identified. Communities can consider these transitways in their comprehensive plans, but corresponding text and maps must clearly identify these transitways as dependent upon funding that is currently uncertain. We encourage communities to conduct local planning that would support ridership and the cost-effective implementation of these transitways, However, communities should not plan as if, if, as if these lines were certain. I'll now cover some specifics on comprehensive planning as it relates to planning for transit. We'll touch upon general requirements, how to get more out of your plan, requirements for transit ways and high frequency routes in your comprehensive plan, and new requirements related to density near transit and the timing and implementation of those requirements. Minimum comprehensive planning requirements for transit are identified in the online local planning handbook under the plan element for transportation. They are also included in your checklist for comprehensive planning on your community page in the local planning handbook. Briefly, comprehensive planning for transit includes the following. A 
The comp plan must include the map, include maps of existing and planned transit services, including local and express routes, transit ways, park and rides, and support facilities. The comp plan must identify and discuss your community's transit market areas and how that relates to transit service. For communities that have future transit ways, your plan should discuss the status of planning for the corridor, including the city's roles and responsibilities. In a moment, we'll discuss a resource on this. For communities that have existing or future transit ways as part of the current revenue scenario, the comp plan must address transit station area density and activity level policies. We'll discuss the applicability and timing of this requirement later in the presentation. For communities that have existing or future transit ways as part of the current revenue scenario, the comp plan must also address access to these stations by bicycling and walking. As mentioned earlier, communities should acknowledge whether or not they are part of the Transit Capital Levy District. This district defines where regular route service is provided in the region based on where communities contribute local property tax for transit capital. As such, this district follows city boundaries. Areas outside of this district are generally associated with Transit Market Area 5, where there isn't the demand for regular route services. Communities have options with regarding to mapping ex both existing and future transit services. This transit mapping example is one from Bloomington's current comprehensive plan. Bloomington uses colors and line types to represent different types of transit service. For example, the blue lines represent an all day level of service. Two different types of dashes represent light rail transit and express bus service. Red represents service that only occurs during the peak period. If we zoom into the Mall of America, we see how the Bloomington South Loop area has a high level of transit service. This type of approach could be helpful for communities as they consider future development, potential for future transit service, and then the needs of pedestrians and bicyclists. Here is an approach that may be helpful for the planning process in your comprehensive plan. As shown here with the city of Egan, your, commun your community may wish to show a more detailed relationship between land use, transit market areas, and existing transit services. Communities can use this kind of review to explore opportunities to lay the groundwork for improved integration between transit service and supportive land use. The local planning handbook includes a number of resources on how to get more out of your plan with transit. Some of these ideas include integrating transit connections into other aspects of planning and vice versa. These approaches may make transit planning more meaningful and engaging for community residents, businesses, and public officials. Understanding your transit market area can help set the stage for changes that improve conditions for transit. Additional development density in the right locations, for example, will improve conditions for transit. It might make existing service more cost effective, or it might create opportunities to improve the frequency of service or the times of day that service is provided. Maybe your community would like to, prove, to improve overall conditions for walking and bicycling. Many transit riders depend on walking and bicycling to transit. Many people in your community might benefit from being able to more easily walk or bike. Your community could think about how the needs of pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit riders overlap. In most cases, transit planning involves multiple communities along a route or within a service area. As mentioned before, your community will share transit market areas with adjoining communities. Having shared goals around transit, walkability, and land use will strengthen existing service and the likelihood of improvements. The map that's shown on the screen is an illustration of how sidewalk improvements would expand the walkability of the area that will be served by the future Golden Triangle Station on the Green Line. In, this station is located in Eden Prairie. Although this station is in Transit Market Area 3, the city is planning for additional density 
and it is closely connected to stations that are located in transit market areas one and two. The map is from a collaborative multi-city planning effort led by Hennepin County. Comprehensive plans also require a housing element. Planning for new housing close to transit may help reduce transportation costs and travel times, which may be especially important for low and moderate income households, including seniors. Such proximity may also open up greater job access for low and moderate income residents. Transit is also an issue of economic competitiveness for the region. Access by transit is valuable to many types of businesses and households. Communities may wish to address how transit provides access to the labor force and how transit could provide economic value. Finally, the issue of re resilience and sustainability may be a comprehensive planning theme for many communities. Transit has an important role to play in reducing carbon emissions by providing an alternative to driving alone. The image on the right reflects collaborative work in and around the future Blake Road Station on the Metro Green Line. This effort was somewhat unique in that it addressed so many multiple issues, including redevelopment near the future LRT station, park improvements, water quality improvements, and affordable housing. Although not solely about transit, the future station is a driving factor for an integrative approach. It has involved a collaboration with partners that include the City of Hopkins, the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, the Metropolitan Council, Hennepin County, and the Urban Land Institute. These and other ideas are located online in the transportation section of the online local planning handbook. The Metropolitan Council provides guidance for communities located in corridors with planned regional transitways. The Transitway Station Guidance Fact Sheet provides information on activities related to planning and implementation during transitway corridor development. This fact sheet is available as a virtual handout in the webinar and can be accessed at the sidebar of your screen. This fact sheet addresses activities during evaluation of corridor alternatives, the project development phase, where early design and environmental analysis is conducted, the engineering and final design phase, and during construction and operation of the transitway. This document identifies activities needed to support the transitway at the local level. They include incorporating small area planning into your comprehensive plan, completing zoning studies and other regulatory changes, and scheduling and coordinating local capital improvements. Planning for growth near transit strengthens the cost effectiveness of regional transit investments. It means that future destinations in the region will be accessible by transit. It also means that transit will be a more viable option for more of the region's residents and employees. Thrive in the Transportation Policy Plan encourage communities to plan for growth near transit and to create places that are walkable and, attract and attractive for higher density development. As part of comprehensive planning, communities are responsible for allocating growth to transportation analysis zones, or TAZs. An online, uh, an online tutorial on allocation of growth to TAZs is available and is one of the links in the webinar handout. The Transportation Policy Plan has new policy expectations for the density of residential development near transit. These expectations apply to the following transit types. Light rail transit, commuter rail, highway bus rapid transit, arterial BRT, and high frequency bus routes. These specific policies do not apply to either local or express bus routes. We nevertheless encourage communities to consider the density of land uses along these routes. These residential density expectations apply to existing transit ways and high, frequency, and high frequency routes, as well as transit ways that are currently under construction. 
It also applies to all transit ways that are part of the current revenue scenario. If planning for the transit way is at a point where station locations and funding are certain, we expect comprehensive plan updates and amendments to reflect this new policy. If station locations and funding are not yet certain, we encourage communities to nevertheless consider them for adoption or to include languages that discusses their future adoption. Residential density expectations only apply to areas within a half mile or 10 minute walk of fixed guideway transit stations. An example of the Southwest Corridor or Metro Green Lines extension is shown on the screen. For arterial BRT or high frequency bus routes, it applies to a smaller geographic area, a quarter mile radius or a, quarter, or a five minute walk. Again, this density requirement only applies to areas identified for new development or redevelopment. We do want to emphasize again that the residential density requirement is not a blanket requirement. It only applies to areas that the city has guided for residential development or redevelopment. It does not apply to established residential areas that are not guided by your community for change. By definition, it also does not apply to areas guided for non-residential uses. The example on the lower right shows a conceptual map where areas of change and stability are defined as part of the local planning process. The area of changes are, are shown in red. From this map, we would evaluate areas guided for new residential development or mixed use development. The residential density requirement is an average of the minimum guiding densities for all areas planned for new development or redevelopment. Some areas can be lower than this minimum, but the overall average minimum should meet the designated minimums. For example, if your community guided land for development at 10 to 20 dwelling units per acre, we would evaluate your plan using 10 dwelling units per acre. As you can see in the table on the screen, the average minimum dwelling units per acre varies by the level of transit investment as well as the community designation. The average minimum density expectation for light rail transit is highest among the different types of transit ways, reflecting the le level of investment for LRT as well as the potential market response. Concurrently, urban center communities have the highest average minimum density expectations among all of the community designations, reflecting recent and likely market activity in these communities. In addition to minimum densities, the TPP also includes suggested target ranges shown in red that are more supportive of transit and reflect planning and market conditions where greater density may be feasible and appropriate. In addition to expectations for density of new residential development, the transportation policy plan encourages communities to plan in such a way that station areas become focal points of activity. This might include employment centers, retail uses, schools, or other civic uses. As a benchmark, the TPP recommends a baseline of planning to accommodate, over time, a mix of 7,000 residents, employees, and or students. Many station areas already meet or surpass this benchmark. A community may plan for higher growth based on market demand and development potential. On the other hand, a community may discover that reaching 7,000 7, may be challenging due to weak market demand or implementation challenges. In those cases, we encourage communities to support different scenarios if conditions might happen to change. We also encourage planning in ways to ensure that development in the short term does not preclude opportunities for greater level of activity in the future. Market studies and urban design studies can shed light onto what might be possible for communities to achieve. The Metropolitan Council's new Transit-Oriented Development, or TOD guide, is a new, resources, a new resource for communities that are exploring opportunities to develop with transit in mind. 
and provides a comprehensive overview of various roles and responsibilities in supporting development near transit. And it delves into important issues of markets, equity, and implementation. A third section addresses more planning fundamentals, such as density, placemaking, and walkability. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I have a few things to mention before we move on to the questions. And here on the screen are a few of the links to resources that may have been mentioned during the presentation today. And uh, the local planning handbook in particular is a key resource for comprehensive plan updates. Uh, the planet page has the most current information available on upcoming events. And we have also included uh, notices for other regional events that are informative about comp plan topics. Uh, other resources here direct you to the transportation policy plan, the new and updated TOD guide, and the Minnesota geospatial commons, where you can download GIS shape files for your mapping purposes. Uh, some additional resources that were mentioned during this webinar are included in the handout. Now, before we actually start the questions, um, I would like to introduce uh, one other person who is present here. Uh, Cole Hineker is a planning analyst in Metropolitan Transportation Services uh, working on transit planning. Now, the first question, what happens if my community can't meet the density requirements for transit? Uh, will we be penalized? Right, I'll take that question. Um, this is um, uh, Michael Larson, or which I can't remember if I'm going by Mike or Michael for this, since we have the same name. Um, community, uh, community should keep in mind that the the again, I'll just emphasize that the minimum density requirement only applies to areas that the city has identified for change, and that, in other words, residential redevelopment or areas that are uh, designated for new mixed use development, and that's an average minimum. So. You know, depending on context, communities could have a lower density minimum for, for guiding land use in some parts of the station area or along a quarter, and they could have higher. Um, you know, we over we believe, uh, as we did our research, we believe that this overall minimum density is a reasonable expectation for, uh, for communities. Um, you know, I, I want to emphasize also that developing transit, uh, identifying transit ways um, and doing station area planning generally has been a collaborative approach. Um, and we would want to continue that. Um, we recognize that there are both opportunities and challenges related to development, um, as well as um, how to increase density, how to make a community more walkable, and uh, setting the stage for for investment. Um, you know, we we expect um, those challenges. Um, you know, some of those could be adequate parcel size, um, um, de density related to design. Um, and in some cases, it may be that the market is not yet ready for higher density, um, but your community can set the stage for comp plan amendments when the timing might be better. Um, staff at the Metropolitan Council, um, including us, the sector rep program, can help you explore this issue uh, in more detail. Um, Great. Thank you. Well, you mentioned challenges. Um, actually, let me ask you this other question that's related. How should we address transit ways if the project has uncertainties like where stations will be or funding for the project? Yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that again, Raya. Um, like with the comprehensive plans last time, where there was some uncertainty, if a community has a preference for an alignment or a station location at the time of adoption, um, the city should articulate that in your comp plan. Uh, if your community is in the middle of uh, exploring alignment or location alternatives, your plan could articulate uh, both like the strengths and weaknesses or the advantages and different disadvantages of different alternatives. Um, and your approach could set the stage for a future amendment once once these decisions, uh, the alignment decisions and the station location decisions are more uh, more concrete. Um, in the meantime, your community needs to choose an interim approach that could either encourage development in likely station locations, uh, supports the status quo, um, or maybe something uh, something in between. Uh, in any case, your community should articulate um, your roles and responsibilities at the particular stage that you are in the transit development process. Okay, great. 
Um, so now we have a couple of uh, questions related to service planning. Uh, who do we talk to about regular uh, route service if we are outside the transit capital levy district? Uh, I can try to feel that one, Raya. Um, I mean, I think the short answer is that I would recommend contacting your local Met Council member um, or their sector representative to discuss those options. Um, you can find who your Met Council member is uh, just by going on their website, metrocouncil.org. Great. Um, well, actually, some somewhat of a similar, well, related question. How can we request changes or improvement to bus service in our community? Uh, yeah, so this is Mike Mecklenburg. I'll, I think I'll take that one as well. Um, I mean, personally, I think the best place to start would be to contact the, the transit planner who manages service in your area. Uh, I'm told that there's a map on the resource handout that will um, identify the, the planners uh, by the community that they, that they manage. If you're not in the Metro Transit Service area, um, please contact your, your local provider directly. Um, but so the transit planner should be able to kind of walk you through your existing service, including any recent or future changes. Um, if you feel that additional service is warranted, if you're looking down the road and you see something big coming up, please start the conversation early with them. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, it takes a long time, you know, at least six months to really go through the process of analyzing the request, connecting with city staff, community stakeholders, developing the new schedule, uh, and then finally have uh, the service uh, hit the street. Um, some of the stuff that we think about um, when adding new service um, are potential ridership, and then of course the, the cost of operating the service um, and vehicle and operator availability. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, do you have a question about the guidelines on activity levels? How did you calculate the guideline for 7,000 residents, employees, or students at station areas? Well, I'll start with the answer, Michael Larson. Um, so again, yeah, it's the guideline is intended to measure people, and those could be residents, um, could be employees, uh, or students in the area. It's meant to be a benchmark um, to achieve um, to uh, stations as being focal points of activity over time. Um, staff here at the council did research um, looking at peer regions uh, related to planning for activity and mix of uses around stations. We also consider the criteria on land use that is related to the um, federal, uh, federal Transit Administration's New Starts criteria, um, kind of related to uh, competitive funding applications for, for project. Um, we've looked at, we also kind of reality tested that with uh, existing transit areas um, to compare where communities were at. Um, so I think, so a number of most, I don't know, most community, most station areas already meet or surpass this uh, benchmark. Um, for comparison purposes, a typical neighborhood like in South Minneapolis is a, around 7,000. Um, and as you might expect, uh, places like you know, the University of Minnesota or downtown Minneapolis far, far surpassed this benchmark. Um, so for communities, um, I'll just add that for communities that have that don't surpass this, this dense level of uh, activity currently, we hope that the high guideline is a way for communities to think about the station areas becoming focal points over time. Um, you know, the success of the transit system really depends on areas becoming uh, focal points of higher density active, um, um, higher density housing, employment centers, uh, civic destinations, schools, that, that kind of thing. So the transit service serving, serving people in the region. Um, you know, different communities may have, um, have different challenges related to uh, reaching that ben benchmark. We may be some issues of connectivity, natural or man-made barriers, like uh, we've discussed earlier in the presentation. Um, so communities should discuss this, uh, discuss those challenges in their plan. Um, and like when we talked about minimum densities, uh, minimum density for residential development, the planning process can really help identify, you know, what the, um, 
what opportunities might be over time and how to preserve those opportunities over time. And like um, from, from market studies that may be how to lay the groundwork or urban design studies that establish some expectations about how to incorporate that additional activity uh, into the future of the station area. Great, thank you. Um, so, a question uh, about my community has seen uh, some recent multifamily development. Can these projects be served by transit? Um, I can take that, Raya. Um, you know, I think the short answer is that it kind of depends. Um, you know, I went over in the presentation some of the factors that we consider um, when adding service or when when looking at um, areas that support transit service. And that would be, are there other destinations nearby that might generate rides? Um, what's the pedestrian access you know, to and from the development? What's the road network to and from the development? And is there any existing service you know, that's already in the area that either they could utilize directly or we could you know, potentially extend or reroute to serve that area? Um, but here again, you know, without knowing the details of this particular situation, I would say the best place to start is uh, by again going to that map, identifying who your plan, who the planner is that represents your community, and uh, contacting them, and they can walk it through with you. Great, thank you. Um, uh, so, if a community has done other planning, like previous station station area plans or bicycle plans that addresses access to transit. Can we incorporate that into our comprehensive plan? Yeah, um, I'll take that. Um, you sure can. <laughs> um, communities can incorporate um, smaller plans, or maybe you've done a bicycle or a pedestrian plan for a community. Um, you can incorporate those plans by reference. What I really strongly recommend is that um, you provide a synopsis of the most important details of those plans. Uh, maybe reference to specific sections of the adopted plan um, in your comp plan. Um, I do have some words of caution about doing that. Um, I want to make sure that such an approach doesn't create some inconsistencies or conflicts between the documents, you know, depending on the, uh, the vintage or the age of the planning. If, it's a, if it was a small area plan that was developed before uh, the new regional policy plans, then they didn't specifically address density or activity levels or some of some factors like that. You want to make sure that there's um, there's an internal consistency. Um, sometimes plans, small area plans can be somewhat ambiguous. Sometimes they can be pretty specific. So that's something to think about um, going forward if you uh, uh, do further small area planning um, subsequent to your comp plan update. Um, you know, ultimately, I think it's really important to make sure that the planning documents speak clearly to stakeholders, to, um, provide clear direction for um, policymakers, planning commissioners, and the development community about you know, what, um, what the expectations are and uh, in what locations and, and when. So, and that's really up to you to, to figure out the best approach. Okay, great. Uh, another question about bus service. Are there other transportation options besides regular bus service? <clears throat> Um, yeah, absolutely. So the Met Council um, supports communities through the entire region uh, with carpool and vanpool services, among other things, other transportation, or excuse me, other travel demand management options. Um, I, I'm not an expert in this field, but I will say that there are a lot of resources on our website. So I guess the questioner can just go to metrotransit.org, and there's a whole section on how to ride and uh, it can kind of walk you through some of the, the processes and options that are available. So again, that's metrotransit.org. I believe the section is called How to Ride for more info. Great, thank you. Um, how can a community change its transit market area? Um, so what do I want, I want to discuss transit market areas. It's really, it's really based on data and research conducted at a uh, level of census geography, the census block group. So that data can change over time. So it's um, so areas that are becoming denser or more interconnected will show up during um, 
uh, be re reflected at the next census. So communities that are planning for growth um, may see their transit market area um, change as that is that as those areas evolve. Um, areas in your community that aren't expecting any change, like as fully as established areas um, that are unlikely to see any any kind of growth, um, are likely to be remains remain the same. So just remember, it's the transit market areas are intended to be a kind of a general planning tool. They don't you know substitute for for route planning or service planning, and they don't necessarily guarantee that a certain kind of transit service would would be either successful or or unsuccessful. Okay, great. Uh, this will be the last question we have time for. Um, I'm still a little confused by average minimum densities. Can you give me an example of how you would calculate that? Sure, I, I could do that. Um, so um, I kind of made, I created a simple example here because I thought I might get this question. Um, so I'll give you a simple example. So say you guided 10 acres of land at a range of 10 to 20 units an acre. Then you guide uh, the area of the same size, another 10 acres at 20 to 30. So you have 10 acres at 10 to 20 and 10 acres at 20 to 30. Um, the, the minimum for one range is 10. The other, the minimum for the other range is 20. So the average of that obviously is would be 15. So that's what we would kind of the that's kind of a simple way that we would take a look at that. Or in your community you should just take a look at it to see how what kind of guiding overall guiding density. Um, you know, obviously, it's a little bit more complicated in practice. If the two areas had been different sizes, then we would do kind of a we would do a weighted average uh, of that. Okay, thank you. If we didn't get to your question today, please feel free to contact Mike or Michael. Uh, <laughs> take your pick. Uh, they would be happy to answer your questions directly. Um, and I would like to mention just a few logistics for our participants and pass on information on some upcoming events this fall. Uh, please join us for the next presentation in the Planet Basics webinar series. On October 13, uh, Steve Elmer and Jan Youngquist will be discussing the Regional Bicycle Transportation Network and Regional Trails and how to address this new requirement in your comprehensive plan. And also a webinar on the housing requirements is planned for later in October. Registration is now open and available on the Planet page of the Local Planning Handbook. If you'd like to view today's presentation again, uh, we will be posting the video on the Planet page of the handbook, and we will also provide a Q&A document for you, and this will include the questions that we didn't get to. Uh, we will prepare an annotated PDF of the PowerPoint slides uh, for the website as well, and this will be posted within the next week. Finally, as you exit the webinar, there is a short five-question survey. Please take just a minute to help us out with that. And if you have any other questions or comments, we're here. Please contact us. Thank you for joining us today.